Um, all right, uh, scripture reading is Proverbs 15, um, 1 through 3. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise adorns knowledge, but the mouth of the fool gushes folly. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. So good morning. Good to see you guys. My name's Brett, um, and uh, we are in the third week of a series called "The Fine Art of Disagreement." And um, what we're talking about is kind of how to how to do disagreement. And um, our first week, uh, we kind of laid the groundwork, and we talked about as Christians, we start, we figure out what we believe. We start with Scripture, and then we use tradition, reason, and experience to kind of uh, interpret Scripture as as we need to. And that's an important groundwork. Um, I'll I'll bet though we didn't like shock anybody. There wasn't anybody that thought, oh no, they read the Bible in church. What have I shown up for? Okay. And, um, and so that was, that was pretty, you know, groundwork expected. Second week, um, what we talked about is that there are things that we um, think are central and some things that we think are not central and that we make a distinction between hills we die on and hills we don't die on. We'll talk about that a little more um, this week. And so that was maybe a little more challenging. Uh, this week, where I want to go is, so what do we do when we still disagree, what do we do when we still disagree? Because here's the thing, conflict is hard and we don't like it. There's the occasional odd bird out there, but most of us really dislike personal conflict. How, I'll bet there's some of you out there um, that if you're going somewhere and you know that there's two people in the room that aren't gonna like each other, you feel sick to your stomach, anybody? Out there, yeah, and so my high empathy people, that's, that's you guys, right? Um, and then, but like none of us want to be in the same room with someone that we are having conflict with. That is just so stinking hard. It, we, we avoid conflict sometimes at almost all costs. But if that's true, if we dislike conflict so much, how come, anybody remember the 90s? Just... <laughs> How come in the 90s, if we dislike conflict so much, did this show get such high ratings? <laughs> Do you guys remember Jerry Springer? Uh, and, um, you know, this was a show that was designed to be shocking, um, to get people that were kind of shocking and dysfunctional on the show together. And, um, and if everything went right, it would end in an all-out brawl. Right, and that was like the great hope of the show, is that at the end of the show, there would be a total meltdown and people would be in full-on fist fights, right? And that's kind of what we watched for. And this was so popular, that guy Steve in the blue shirt, he got his own show just because he was the security guy in Jerry Springer. And then there was all these spinoffs. There was Maury and Ricky Lake, and it was a huge deal. Um, and, and then it, as ratings for that started to dip just at the time uh, that reality TV started to pick up. And we transferred our um, conflict fix from, uh, from those kinds of shows as a culture onto reality TV. We're like, the whole idea is that we're going to take a group of people that are going to hate each other. We're going to like literally drop them off on an island and film it for a month. <laughs> Some of you were like, that's what Thanksgiving is like at my house. <laughs> All right. And, um, and, you know, and, and these shows were hugely popular. And it wasn't too long after reality TV um, picked that conflict thing up and realized that conflict gets ratings and that pretty much every major news station and outlet figured out that people want conflict more than they want news. And so every discussion, every panel, every phone call, every interview was designed for conflict. Because somewhere in us, we want it. We want to see it. And, and then after that, social media, and it takes off, you know, and the conflict there. And how many times have you scrolled through, oh, the, that God-forsaken wasteland called the comment section? You know, if you're ever feeling too good about humanity, just go to YouTube and read some comments. You, you know? And so, and, and we just can spend time. So here's the thing. Do we, do we, do we hate conflict or do we want it? 
Do we, do we hate it or do we want it? And I think that we don't want the f to be in the fire of conflict, but we want to be close enough to roast a marshmallow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we don't want to be the people ourselves in the fight, but we want to see it. Yeah, and, and, and it's not all bad. Every story that has ever been told that's worth listening to is about conflict. Every movie you've ever watched that you care about has conflict at the center of it. No one ever paid money to watch a movie that went, woman wakes up, her life is great, she goes to bed, the end. That's not a movie, right? Something tragic happens and she has to overcome it, right? Or, you know, whatever it is. That is how we do story. Tens of thousands of people um, every weekend, sometimes 100,000 people plus, go to watch a sporting event in person because there's conflict there. And, and not, that's not all bad, but here's the thing. We tend to not want to be the people in the conflict. We just get some sort of buzz out of seeing the people who are. Now, one of the, the reasons why I think maybe we're wired into being attracted to conflict, as hard as it is, is because conflict is an unavoidable and essential, essential ingredient in community. You cannot have relationships with other people real relationships and avoid conflict. They are absolutely wired into us as people and how we interact with each other. It's a part of what we do. You can't have people without conflict, but different systems, different families, we handle conflict differently. Um, for example, I've heard over the last year several um, people from the Jewish community talk about how in a Jewish family, part of their culture is that they can fight because at the end of the day, we're still family and we're going to be together. So the fact that we're going to hammer this out over dinner is not going to affect our relationship at the end of the day. So they feel free to have open conflict about ideas and discussions and things going on in the family. Now listen, that is hard to hear for a boy. My entire family is from Georgia and Mississippi. And in the South, God bless the South, I love it, biscuits and gravy, you know, come on. But in the South, the cardinal rule is don't be rude. Now, behind the door, you can say whatever you want about somebody as long as you say, bless their heart. <laughs> right? And, and, and in the South, for all of the good stuff, you, you know, there's, there's this like repressed conflict floating around. And, you know, and you're like, ladies, stop making sideways comments about their pecan pie and just have it out. You, you with me? And, uh, and so that can go on a lot in, in the South. And, uh, but in, in like Jewish families, that, that tends to be more open. So I don't know what your family system was like, but people equals conflict. And I've got some bad news for you. The church is people. And I know someone's like, oh, I knew it. I mean, I was hoping church was just buildings and programs and a staff, but it turns out it's people. I hate people. <laughs> right? And here's the thing, you know, a few centuries ago, we started using language wrong and we started calling buildings churches. Huge mistake, don't know how that filtered in. Uh, you know, that's like calling your house your family. I mowed the lawn in front of my family today. Like, and, but we call, we call the church the building, which is, which is strange and awkward and I don't know how to get the language back, but that was, that was a serious mistake. And, and here's the thing, is the church is the people. Church isn't programs. It's not worship services. It's not a building. It's certainly not a staff. We're not that cool. Church is people. Therefore, conflict and church are inseparable. If we're going to actually be in community with one another, we have to have conflict and we have to figure out how to do it well. And so it probably wouldn't surprise you to find out that conflict has been a part of church from go, from the start because there were people in it. And, and if we're not gonna have people, we're not gonna have a church. And so what I'd like to do is look at um, one of my favorite um, books of the Bible. If, if you uh, spend a lot of time in scripture, you probably have some places that you just love and gravitate towards. Um, for me, like Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is probably my main one, um, but Philippians is probably my, my number two. And I, I just, I wanna uh, look in Philippians today and what's going on there is this is a letter written to a church in Philippi by one of the first Christians, a man named Paul, who planted a church there. He was uh, a rising star in the Jewish religious community, left that community when he started to follow Jesus and um, planted churches around the Mediterranean uh, rim. And one of those towns was called Philippi. And, and he is now in a Roman jail and is riding into their church many years after leaving. Um, and in, uh, in chapter four of that letter, uh, this is what he says. Therefore, 
my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. Stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Eudia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. So I want you to picture this, how they did this is they would, um, when they would get a letter, they would call church. And everybody would come over probably to a house um, or a courtyard if someone in the church had, had more money and more space. They would gather at their house and they'd get, I don't know, hundreds of people together and they'd be reading it. And about halfway through Paul's letter where he talks about the glory of God and all this kind of stuff, he, it says, and you two ladies, hundreds of people here, you two ladies need to pull it together. <laughs> Paul was Jewish. And he knew how to have conflict openly in family because at the end of the day, we're still family. And here's the thing is, can you imagine what was going on? We have no details about what their conflict was over. Was it about doctrine? Was it about the belief about something about God? Or did someone make fun of someone else's teeth? We don't know. But whatever it was, was so harmful to this church that word has left Philippi, gone many miles by boat or by donkey on a Roman road and gotten all the way to a jail cell in Rome and Paul says, you're kidding me, we have to address that. So whatever it was, was a big enough deal for him to deal with in this way. And he says that this conflict in the church is if you guys can't figure out how to disagree, it's going to tear things apart and so we're gonna do some repair work with everybody involved, and because we love you, because we love you. And he says, have the same mind. I pray that Eudia and Syntyche help them have the same mind. What does that mean, to have the same mind? I'll tell you what I think it means later, but I wanna start with what I think it doesn't mean. Uh, and so when I was preparing for this message, I you know, do a lot of easy way to get some good material is just to Google, like agree to disagree and the word Bible. And I got a lot of people. Um, and, and so it just pulled this from a blog. Um, and I took the name out because I don't, I don't wanna um, like openly hurt the person here. Uh, but it says, in, it, this is from their blog. In matters of doctrine, there can be no agreement to disagree. One's teaching conforms to the New Testament or it does not. A doctrine is scriptural or it is not. One is in fellowship with God and God's children based on the truth or he is not. One is abiding in the doctrine of Christ or he is not, exclamation point. And this person calls themselves guardian of truth. Like, we found him, everybody. The Holy Spirit's on the internet and he thinks for all of us. It's great. We just gotta find his blog and he'll tell us what to think about everything. I love it. And see, here's the problem with this, with this mindset is they assume that figuring out the teaching of the New Testament is always easy. Now listen, there's stuff that's clear. Clear as night and day. And I know what they're defending is they, they wanna say that we need to stand for something. That there's stuff that we actually say we believe and there is. There's th we, we don't wanna give up on the idea of truth. Truth matters. What we believe matters. And there's some stuff is not fuzzy in scripture. If, if, if I'm talking to someone, they're like, yeah, but what does he mean by adultery? I mean, shut up. <laughs> shut up, stop cheating on your wife, I'll slap you, right? Like, we don't need to work on that one too hard, you know. But then there's a lot of stuff in scripture that is challenging. You know, there's a command in scripture for women to not braid their hair in the New Testament. Now, and so in a case like that, is that one of those things that's written for all people for all time? Or, like I think, is that written to a specific context for a specific purpose because what's going on in their culture and the thing that's underneath it that we need to find is that God thinks that modesty is important and we shouldn't try to one-up each other by how we look, right? There's, there are six times in the New Testament, six times in the New Testament, it commands us to greet each other with a holy kiss. None of you kissed me today. <laughs> I'm hurt, and you're living in error. <laughs> See, here's the thing, and the people that are like, that are always like, we take the Bible literally, take the Bible literally, they don't kiss each other either. You know, and so wait, which, which one is it? 
And see, the, the, even if people think that we just take the Bible literally, we don't because we all are sorting through, we're sorting through the hard work of interpretation. And that is a part of Christianity. And so if we do the hard work of interpretation, sometimes we're gonna land in different places. And what do we do with that? Hey, what do we do with a scripture like this? What does guardian of truth guy do with Romans 14? So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put a stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. The, the uh, New Living Translation says it like this. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble or fall. Or here, here's the message, the message paraphrase. Tend to your knitting. You've got your hands full just taking care of your own life before God. Isn't that great? Forget about deciding what's right for each other. Here's what you need to be concerned about. That you don't get in the way of someone else making life more difficult than it already is. Summary, stay in your lane, man, right? And we don't need to, because we're gonna give an account before God, we don't need to get in each other's business all the time. Now, here's the challenge, is that in that context, what he's talking about there is issues around food, which in their culture was deeply important. Well, what food do we eat to honor God or eat that dishonors our life before God? How does that work? And I know to us, that's kind of lost. We're like, you wanna be a vegan? Fine, I'm going to Dexter Barbecue. I win, right? I mean, like, we, we, we don't get the heat around that, but in their culture, that mattered. And Paul is saying, look, stop deciding what's right and wrong for each other. But in other places in Scripture, he does say these are things that we are not going to budge on. And so how do you sort through when there are different kinds of issues that fall in different sort of boundaries? And boundaries are required for a thing to be a thing. If you don't have a boundary, something isn't whatever you think it is. We have physical boundaries as our bodies. Our houses have boundaries. Uh, there, there's boundaries in nature. There, I mean, the boundaries are important for something to thrive, for it to exist. Love always creates some sort of boundary. And so here, are, here is just my attempt at creating some boundaries for us, okay? So first of all, let's talk about opinion. Opinion are things that we can have a good discussion about, we can talk about over a meal, and if we disagree, we can just move on with our lives. Opinions are things like style of worship music, if we're talking about church stuff, um, or, or the moderate use of alcohol. Um, you know, this is, uh, scripture is clear that, that it is completely improper for a believer in Christ to get drunk, completely improper. Um, but the moderate use of alcohol, um, is that something we, sh we should use or not? What about people, if I'm around someone that does struggle with alcohol, Alcohol? Is that hurting them or should I just use moderation? There's lots of opinions about that. Um, opinion, um, the best way to help the poor, lots of ways uh, to, to do that. Parenting styles, the Bible says a little bit about parenting, not a lot. Um, health choices is an opinion. Or what about um, opinions about uh, the, the quality of Ron's preaching and or baseball jokes? <laughs> I mean, th these are things that we can have opinions about, we can talk about, we can care about. But at the end of the day, let's move on. Um, or... Uh, if you're not just talking about opinion, there's things that are important. If we're talking about church teaching, we're talking about what's called doctrine. And those would be things like the roles of men and women in church. Uh, I'm sure many of you have been in context that believe something different than we do. We believe that a woman could have any level of leadership in a church. We could have a woman senior pastor in this church one day, and that would be okay. Um, but I know some people believe differently, and that's, that's important. Um, or the roles of men and women in, in family. Um, or or uh, issues about baptism. That, that can be deeply important. What it says about God. What it says about us and community and faith. Um, views on divorce. Some of you are carrying scars from how church people have handled views on, on divorce. Um, but those are things that are important. But even more than that, there's things that we would say are core in church world, we'd call that dogma. That particular word has kind of gotten a bad rap in the last generation. But these are things at the absolute core of what we believe. Things like the resurrection of Jesus. We're not gonna budge on that. The authority of scripture or the dignity of every person. Those are things at the core of what we believe. And now, I think that boundaries, like I said, are important. But one of, um, we make two errors 
typically so that we can avoid conflict. The first error, like the guardian of truth perspective, is that we push everything, every opinion and important thing and all that, and we push it into the core. And we say that if you're gonna be around me, you have to agree with me on this. And, and just, it's, it's just wonderful that God happens to agree with me on everything. And so, uh, very nice of him. And so everything is gonna be in the core. And that's a way of avoiding conflict because that means that if you don't agree, you have to leave. And we're gonna take our little community, we're gonna have like a wall and a moat, you know, and a drawbridge, um, and we're only gonna let people in that agree. The, the other way of avoiding conflict is that we push everything out. We push everything out to opinion. And, and we say that just whatever you think's fine, whatever I think's fine, whatever he think's fine, and, and nothing is worth struggling over. Nothing is worth having a deep, serious conversation about. And that, that is also deeply destructive. Uh, and and uh, you know, kind of our culture picks one or the other. We either make everything a fight or everything's just kind of opinion. And I think as the church, we can do better than that. We can love each other in the conflict. And so let me just, this is just my attempt again, but let me kind of give you some, if we can't agree on these things, maybe this is what we can do. If you can't agree on opinions, so what? Just get back to the meal, get some more chips and salsa, we're all good, all right? Uh, but if we can't agree on important things, chances are at the end of the day, we are going to have different core relationships, and that's okay. If there's enough things in the important category that we don't agree on, these are important. I'm not just talking about your buddies, I'm talking about your core relationships in life. Chances are we are going to have different core relationships if we don't agree on a lot of those important things. And that's all right. We can do those, we can have those boundaries out of love and respect for one another. If we disagree on some core things though, chances are we're gonna have different communities. And that's all right. That is not the end of the world. I can love you and us be in different communities. And I think that can be hard for us to say that we're gonna have boundaries, but that's all right. And so in our, our, our church, um, wh where people would fall on core issues and important things would, uh, would impact the level of leadership and influence that we let folks have in our community. That's all right. That's, that, that can be done with love. That can be done with love and that's creating a boundary. Every family has good boundaries. Now, I think that that can be tough, but here's the thing, always, always, always love. We can disagree and love, can't we? We can disagree and treat each other with honor and dignity, can't we? And so here's, over here, we, we can disagree on things that are opinion and important and even core, and that's all right. And so that's an important thing to hammer out, but let me switch and it's a whole different conversation. This is about disagreement. Let me have the conversation about what happens if somebody's a jerk. Tracking? And so that is a, a bit of a different thing. I wanna look in, in the book of Titus, um, in chapter three, um, it'll be on the screens. Um, he says, avoid foolish controversies about genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law. Now the first couple of verses in Titus chapter three are totally worth your time. He is talking about core stuff like essential stuff. It'll make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. It's so beautiful. But then he switches. And he says uh, foolish things about uh, arguments and quarrels about genealogies and the law because these are unprofitable and what's that word? Useless. Verse 10. Warn a divisive person once, then warn them a second time, and after that have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self condemned. And so he's not talking about disagreeing on opinion or important or core. He's talking about someone that's divisive, someone that wants to start a fight. And they're going to come in and they're going to create disunity and disruption by making people argue over things that don't really matter. Are we tracking? And, and here's what we're going to do as a church. We're going to warn you once, we're going to warn you twice, and then we're going to send you to the Baptists. <laughs> or the Catholics or the Pentecostals or the whatever. The point is, and I know some of you are here because the Baptists sent you here. <laughs> They're like, we can't handle you, go to LaCroix. <laughs> Welcome. Um, and uh, 
And look, 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 but this, this is the thing. This is the thing. Now, here's the, here's the topic. You can be in our community, and we'll disagree about opinions, and, and we'll disagree about important things. You can even disagree with us about core stuff as long as we're having the conversation and working through it, and we're being open and honest in conversation. But what we won't deal with is someone who's being a turd. And so here's, here's the thing, and I'm going to put on my helmet, and you can send me the angry email later. L listen, the tightest boundaries in our community are not around our doctrine. The tightest boundaries in our community are around how we treat each other. The tightest boundaries in our community are around how we treat each other. And we are going to treat each other well. Jesus prays for unity in John 17. He says, I pray that they would be one, his disciples. Pray that they would be one, Father, as you and I are one. And I think sometimes a false conception or an unhelpful conception of unity can kind of throw us off and mess us up. Um, and this, this isn't just about uh, church stuff. This is marriage and friendships and your relationships with each other. Um, if, if we have, you know, kind of, if there's an I, here's a person over here. And if we think that a relationship with another is bound up in where we overlap and agree. And that a relationship is kind of something that we, um, the, the, the places where we overlap, that's the place where, where the, the relationship is. And um, a little bit like, like two pieces of Play-Doh that are getting smashed together, you know, and, and the bonding is over similarity. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, if we're a Christian, God is in the mix too, and then we can overlap. But here, here's the challenge with this model, is you are not your own person, and I am not my own person. We are somehow joined here, and if you disagree with me, it feels like you're taking something away from me. And this, when someone disagrees with us, it, it, it feels like abandonment. It feels like injury. If someone disagrees with you, it feels like they're wronging you because they have taken something away from you, something that they overlapped with you. They're kind of like pulling away. And, and that kind of thing always um, produces fear. Right? And fear, people react through control. I am going to control you and what you think. I am going to make sure that you don't leave. I'm going to make sure that we always agree. And in this place, we don't agree to disagree because that would be too wounding to me. This is insecurity and it masks as power. And it always results in fear. That plays out in churches, marriages, work relationships, whatever. But maybe a healthier model for understanding if we can look at how the church has talked about the Trinity if we could start at how God's relationship is with God's self inside of the Trinity, we believe God is, is, is three people in a community that is God. Each person is God and not each other. And, and so there, there is an I and there is a separate you. And then if a Christian is in the mix, there is God. Oh, newsflash, we're not God. He's separate and God's not us. Isn't that nice? Um, and the relationship is in the exchange. The relationship is in the giving and the receiving. In John 17, Jesus says, Father, the glory you have given me since the beginning of creation, I have given to them. There is this giving and receiving and that holy self-giving love is what creates unity. And in this model, when you disagree with me, that creates the chance for more giving and more receiving. Our differences are the place where we can love each other more. Jesus says it this way. He says, if you love those who already love you, what good is that? Even the Gentiles do that. But I tell you, love your enemies. Enemies. See, this is Christian love, is that we can give, and if someone is different than us, what that should create in us is curiosity. 
where we don't try to control the person, we try to listen. We extend in listening, we examine ourselves so that we can receive and give in this relationship. And it doesn't threaten me if you think something differently than me. That is okay. We're just gonna try to be open to God and each other in this whole exchange. And I think that that is the kind of unity that God is calling us to. Not the one that controls each other, but the kind that is deeply curious about each other and still willing to have tough conversations about important things that we believe. Now, and so when he says, um, when he's talking to Eudia and Syntyche, I just want you to notice how non-threatening Paul is around this. If we can go to uh, chapter four, starting in verse one, and then we'll look at verse three, then we'll kind of talk about the meat of the sandwich in verse two. He says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, You see how he refers to these people that he's in conflict with and that are having conflict with each other? What what if we referred to people that we disagree with as you who I love and long for? What does that change? My joy and my crown. Stand firm in the Lord in this way. Or jump down to verse three. Yes, I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended by my side at the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of his co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Notice he does not question their salvation. He doesn't question their commitment to the gospel or to Jesus. And he says, I know that their names are in the book of life. What if when we disagree with someone, we said, you, I know, are interested in the cause of the gospel? and that you are one of my co-workers and your name is in the book of life. Well, doesn't that change the conversation? Or what about this in, in verse two? If we can go back, it says, I plead with Judea and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. If it doesn't mean we have to agree on everything, what does it mean? I think we find it if we back up two chapters. In chapter two, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. Now check this out. In your relationships with one another, have the, say this with me, same mind is Christ Jesus. This is the mind he wants them to have. Are you ready? Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance of a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. When he says that these two people that are having conflict need to have the same mind, he doesn't say they need to agree, he says they need to lay their lives down for each other. That that is the mind that the church is gonna have when we're in disagreement with one another. We are going to serve each other in love, humbled themselves, taking the very posture of a servant and being obedient to one another all the way to death. Well, I will die for you. And in the context of us laying our lives down for each other, we can disagree all we want if we keep our eyes on Jesus. Because that is who we're following. And that is how he loves us. We did not agree with him when he came and laid his life down for us. And so we don't need to wait for people to agree with us for us to lay our lives down for them. And in fact, that becomes the gospel for the world watching us. That gets me excited. And that's the kind of love that I would like to invite us into. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna pray. And uh, I'm gonna create just a little space. If you'd like to get something to, to write on, this might be helpful for you. We're just gonna take a couple of minutes and reflect before we go. So let's do that. Let's go to God in prayer. Jesus, um, we thank you that you laid your life down for us. That you didn't wait for us to agree with you before you humbled yourself to serve. And God, we pray that you would help us serve those that we disagree with and love them deeply. 
So uh, what I'd ask you to do right now is if you need to write this down, fine. If not, just let it come to your mind. Do you tend to push everything into the core and people that disagree with you can't be around you? Or do you tend to push everything into opinion where it's not worth having hard conversations about important things? Just give you a minute. Secondly, just let the Holy Spirit bring to mind anyone that you either need to reach out to to have a challenging conversation with or someone that that you need to apologize to. You can write their name down. Lord God, we ask that you would make us little Christs in the world. And that as we go through the difficulty of trying to follow you, that you would always, always, always help us love one another, even as we have boundaries in community. Thank you.